Good morning. This morning we are going to continue our Bible study here in the book of 1 Samuel. Uh, We're going to be looking at chapter 8. Last time we looked at chapter 7 and what we saw was that Samuel told Israel, hey, you guys have been living in sin. Uh, You need to repent. You need to turn from God. You need to get rid of these false gods. You need to get rid of these idols and you need to follow me. And so Israel does as Samuel requests and they come before God um, and they bow before God and, and they, they get rid of their idols and they confess their sins and they cry out to the Lord uh, that he would save them from the Philistines. Meanwhile, Samuel takes a, a lamb and offers it as an offering to the Lord. Um, and God answered and said that he would take care of this situation. Uh, the Lord defeats the Philistines and the people of Israel are excited and ecstatic because God has shown up and done great things. And we talked about how Samuel was a judge, just like we see in the book of Judges. Um, and how this event that transpired is just like the book of Judges where Israel sins against God. Uh, God judges Israel uh, by the hand of a, an, an enemy, in this case the Philistines. Israel cries out to God and repents. Um, and God sends a deliverer, which he actually is the one here. God delivered them from the hand of the Philistines. He threw them into confusion. Um, but also Samuel was his judge. Um, But then eventually after Israel is saved, they turn back and go into their way of sin. Um, And the cycle continues again and again and again. Uh, But the judges cycle is coming to a close uh, because chapter 8 is going to end the judges. And so chapter 8, it says, it came to pass when Samuel was old. Um, Weird note, my commentary says he's 60. Uh, When I read that someone's old in the Bible, I usually assume that they're like, 80 or 90. I don't usually assume that they're 60. Uh, but anyways, it says in my, my commentary here that he was about probably 60 years of age. Um, and so it says it would came to pass and Samuel was old that he made his sons judge judges over Israel. Um, again, side note, my, my commentary here says that uh, he made them the, the sons of uh, the judges in Beersheba, which is about 57 miles south of Ramah, where Samuel was judged. And so they're kind of split up. They're not right there. Um, they're, they're in separate spots so that they can have, have power and, and judgment and uh, discernment over Israel. It's supposed to be for the glory of God. But if you keep reading, it says the f- name of the firstborn was Joel, and the name of the second was Abijah. And they were judges in Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways, and they turned aside after dishonest gain, took bribes and perverted justice. And all of a sudden we're kind of reminded of Eli and his sons that opened up the book of Samuel. Samuel um, ends up taking over after Eli and his sons are completely done away with because of their sin before God. And you think that Samuel would be someone, as we've seen the life of Samuel, we didn't really know much about Eli. You think Eli would have put away his sons too or told him, hey, you're not going to have power if you're going to be dishonest before the Lord. <clears throat> but maybe Samuel didn't realize it since they were so far away. I don't know. Um, I would imagine he had to know since there's complaints coming from the people. Uh, but but his sons are taking bribes. Uh, it says they're perverting justice, which probably means they're getting paid to, to look the other way and do different things. Um, and they're, they're going after dishonest gain. I mean, that all sounds like one big you know scheme that's there, that they're trying to make gain of the things of this world rather than the things of God, rather than following God in the way that God wants to be followed and served um, and held as regarded as holy. <clears throat> Instead of doing that, they are doing their own thing. They're like, hey, we don't care. Uh, you know, we got this power. Uh, and, and really, if you look at it, their dad's Samuel, and they probably think that they got it all figured out and they got it all together because Samuel's got so much power and so much, you know, uh, so much God in him that, that people probably just look at them and assume that they're, they're good people, uh, which makes their, their con and then their deception even that more, uh, you know, upsetting and, and frustrating. Uh, and, and it's, it's so weird because again, I just, I can't imagine why Samuel would just let them sit in this position. But I also, you know, you'd almost want to imagine that God would do away with them as well. And yet God doesn't do that. And Samuel doesn't do that. And so it leads to the events that come, uh, here in the rest of this chapter. And it says, all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, look, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the other nations. And so Israel's sin in the last chapter 
that they had to repent from was because they wanted to be like all the other nations. They wanted to worship the gods of the other nations. <clears throat> they wanted to have this idolatry and do these different things of these other nations. And so uh, we saw that. And I think I even mentioned that they want to be like everybody else. That's just kind of the way that Israel continued to be and, and, and continued to do. For some reason, God has never been enough. And uh, I say that, and yet, you know, we can look at our own lives and say, you know what, is God enough? Is God enough for you? Is God enough for me? And the answer is yes, God is more than enough. <clears throat> God is all that we need. And yet we don't always, you know, live our lives that way. We don't always say, hey, God's enough. Let me just live that 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 way. Let me just say, God's all that I need. Um, I, I want to lay everything down for the Lord. I want to surrender all to God. Uh, we, we, we live lives that, that just kind of reject God and, and are like the rest of the world. And so Samuel's like, uh, Samuel here is, is one that's following God with abandon, but his sons are not. And then the rest of Israel now has decided that they no longer want Samuel because he's old. What if he dies? Um, and if he dies and their sons are in control and that's a disaster, uh, because of their sin. And, and so in one sense, like, yeah, if they're looking to the future and they see that Samuel's sons are sinful, they want to make a way and a new way. But the reality is they should cry out to the Lord to show up here and to do a mighty work, to do a mighty act, to bring about some kind of change here uh, in leadership. Maybe somebody has a child and leaves them with Samuel, just as, as uh, Hannah had a child and left Samuel with Eli, and he becomes the next judge of Israel. You know, I don't know what, what God would do there. I'm sure he would answer prayers. He would walk if, if the people of Israel wanted to respond in obedience to him. But instead of trusting in God, they take matters into their own hands because they have to be in control. And I think a lot of times we might be in the same boat, like we want to be in control. And so we try to take things into our own hands. We want to do things our own way. We want to make it go the way that we want it to go, uh, rather than just letting go and letting God do what God's going to do. Rather than just saying, God, I let this go. I put this in your hands. Uh, I, I cast my cares on you. And I remember about two months ago, maybe... Or <clears throat> three months ago, I did a sermon and, and uh, I was reading and doing some study and I came across something in Peter. Uh, and we know that scripture where God says, cast your cares on me because I care for you. Uh, and that was the same thing as, as, as they said that it was the same word used as people that would, would take off their clothes uh, their, their shirts, you know, uh, when Jesus rode into the city and would lay down their, their clothes before Jesus, it was like they were taking it completely off and letting go of it. They weren't holding on to it at all. And so it's the same thing for us. We're supposed to cast our cares on God to let go and let God do what God's going to do to trust in him. Like if we don't trust in our God, then why do we serve him? Why do we follow him? There's no point. But we know that our God is trustworthy and we should be able to cast our stuff upon him. And to know that he cares for us and that he's going to come through, that he's going to do good things, that he's going to work and, and move in, in each and every situation for his glory and his honor. And so we could trust God. We don't always have to be in control, even though we like to be, even though we want to be, even though we want to influence and, and manu manipulate and maneuver situations uh, so that they go the way that we think they should go. God's way is always the best way. And we need to let go and let God do what God's going to do. But Israel doesn't do that. They take this into their own hands and say, Samuel, give us a king. We want to be like all the other nations. And now just one more thing. The other nations are not supposed to, Israel is never supposed to be like the other nations. They're supposed to be God's chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation set apart so that everyone would look at them and see the way that God is moving in them and God is blessing them and how their relationship with God is thriving and prospering and how God is working there so that these people and these other nations would want to be like Israel. That is God's purpose and plan there for Israel to be a light in that community that all the nations would want to be like Israel and to follow God, to give God the glory, to give God the honor and praise and to abandon these false idols that they're worshiping. But Israel fails at their mission. Israel fails at their mission, um, ultimately through Jesus uh, the mission of God is fulfilled in that he, he comes and suffers and bleeds and dies on the cross for everyone, that everyone may see that Jesus is good. Uh, but now as followers of Jesus, that has become our mission to be the light that shines in our, our culture, the light that shines in the people around us, that people would look at us and, and that we ourselves as followers of Christ would not want to be like everyone else, but that 
everyone else would want to be like us. Uh, not because we're perfect, don't get me wrong, but because of the relationship that we're called to have with God, the lifestyle that we're called to have that's set apart and holy, where we've cast down all, all our idols, where we've cast down all our, our old ways, where the old is gone and the new has come and the Holy Spirit is moving and working in our lives. And we're, we are one, uh, one body that's joined together by the blood of Jesus that is, is, is filled with the Spirit that is in perfect relationship with God because of what God has done and who God is is now we are the ones that are the royal priesthood and, and the chosen people that are supposed to shine our light that the people around us would know God and surrender to him. But again, a lot of times we fall into the culture. And so we're doing almost the exact same thing as Israel. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, something's got to change with that. We can't fall into that path. We can't get frustrated when we read about Israel and let our lives and our lifestyles continue to reflect the old people that we used to be in the sinful nature, uh, but rather we need to let the fruit of God flow through us that all the earth and all the world would see who we are for his glory. And so back into the scripture here, verse six says, the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. And I like that. I like that. I didn't really catch that the first couple of times I read this, but the thing displeased Samuel. Like that made Samuel mad. Now, I don't know about you, but if something makes me mad, I usually go to God and, and, and I want to tell God like, this is annoying. I, I'm tired of this. Why is it like this? This needs to change. This is how it needs to go. Again, trying to, to control things, which is not what we're supposed to do, right? We're supposed to give it over to God. And that's what Samuel does. He's like, this is displeasing. This is frustrating. This is making me upset and annoyed but I'm going to go take it to the Lord and let's go see what God has to say about it. Let's go see what God's plan is here. Let's go trust in the Lord. And so Samuel trusts in God to show up here and to work in this for his glory. And the Lord said to Samuel, heed the voice of the people in all they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them. Now that's probably not the answer Samuel wanted to hear, uh, but in some way, maybe, because Samuel has now been validated in his feelings by God, that God, too, doesn't think that this is right, uh, that God thinks that this is not good. Um, and he says, hey, don't, don't take this to heart because the people didn't reject you. God says they've rejected me. And that's a huge issue. Uh, that's a huge issue for the people of Israel uh, because to reject God is, is the worst thing that they could possibly do. Um, but it's a big issue for us. Because Israel, again, wanted to be like everybody else. And so they reject God uh, as, as their ruler and Lord over, over their lives. And I think sometimes we could fall into the same boat uh, as Israel in that situation where we reject God. And either we want to be our own God or we want to have other things take place in our lives that, that we can try to thrive and prosper uh, our own way rather than relying upon God and what God's got going on. And so Israel rejects God. And as they reject God, um, God says, hey, just, just let it happen, Samuel. They rejected me. They don't want me to reign over them anymore. It has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with you being a bad judge. It's got everything to do with me. And it says, according to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, all the works which they have done which, since the day that I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day with which they have forgot, forsaken me and served other gods, so they are doing uh, to you also. So God's like, this is all this has been going on since I brought them up out of Egypt. Like you saw, you know the, the works I did, Samuel. You know how I loved my people. I heard their cry. They cast and trust on me to get them out of Egypt. And I did. And ever since then, all they've done is turn back and worship idols and want to be like everyone else. You know the frustration that this has been since, since the beginning. So they're doing to you as they've done to me this entire time. Now you know what I'm going through. You know, God's like, Samuel, now you're getting a taste of what I've had to go through since since I brought them out of Egypt and, and the frustration and, and the jealousy that God has, right? He says, I'm a jealous God, have no gods before me. And the, and the anger that God has had because of, of their sin of turning from him to do these things that are worldly, to go after worldly gods and worldly things. And so again, for us, we have to make sure that we're not walking in that. And I get God, God of grace and mercy, and that's great. But he doesn't want us to be like the world. And he doesn't want us to be like everyone else. And he doesn't want us to be our own gods. And he doesn't want us to be in control. He wants us to surrender everything to him, including our control for his glory. 
So verse 9, it says, Now therefore, heed their voices. However, you, sure, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behavior of the king who will reign over them. God's like, let them do what they want to do, but give them a warning first. Uh, he's like, it's going to happen, but nevertheless, you need to warn them so that we can't say, hey, I didn't tell you so. Uh, more so, so God can't say, hey, this is what I told you is going to happen, uh, you know, sometime down the line. So Samuel, of course, does what God says. Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked for him, asked him for a king. And he said, this will be the behavior of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them uh, for his own chariots to be his horsemen. And some will run before his chariots. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties, will set some to the plow his grounds and to reap his harvest, and some to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers. He will take the best of your fields, your vineyards, your olive groves, and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your, vinti and, uh, and your vintage and give it to his officers and servants. And he will take your male servants and female servants, your finest young men and your donkeys, and put them to work. He will take a tenth of your sheep and, will, and you will be his servants. And you will cry out in that day because of the king whom you have chosen for yourselves. And the Lord will not hear you that day. Now all of a sudden, you read this, and as people that know the rest of his story, this sounds pretty good that, that Samuel uh, is warning them. And you think Israel would say, no, we don't want that. We don't want the king. That sounds horrible. That sounds awful. I mean, Israel had so much freedom, and I don't think we realize the freedom that they have. I mean, could you imagine living in the United States and not having to pay taxes? Um, that would be incredible. And that's one of the big things that, that, that they're going to have to do. They're going to have to pay a tenth of their money. They're going to have to pay a tenth of all of these different things, of their grain and, and all of this different stuff. And they're going to have to give up their, their daughters and their sons. And, and they're going to be bakers and cooks in their house. They're going to have to give up their servants for the king. They're going to have to give up you know, their family to go and serve in, in wars and all sorts of things. And all of a sudden, this sounds like a terrible situation. And yet Israel does not heed the warning of God. Israel does not heed God's warning. They don't care about all this stuff. They just think, you know what, that's fine. We'll go with it. And maybe the worst of the worst thing is the Lord will not hear you in that day. And you see, this is, this is the opposite of what's happened in the time of the judges. Israel would cry out to God because of the oppression of the other nations and God would hear them. And God would show up and God would respond to their prayer because of their cry. And God would deliver them from the hand of these nations that were ruling over them. But God will not hear their cry in the time of the king when the king is the one who's doing the oppressing. Because this is exactly what they've asked for. They've asked for a king to rule over them. And it's not that even a judge necessarily ruled over them before. But rather that God ruled over them through a judge. And whether they realize it or not, they've rejected God as being their king. And they now want a king, an earthly king, a person king, who, who will step up and, and do, um, do, do what, what they think is going to be a fantastic act. But, but obviously God's way and God's acts and God's actions are always better. And so this, this verse 19 says, Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, No, but we will have a king over us. And he will may be like, or that we may also be like all the nations that our king may judge us and go out to battle for us and fight for us. We want to be like everyone else. There it is again. Just continues to, re, to show up, to be there again and again. We want to be like everyone else. We want to be like all the other nations. We want a king that will judge us. Your sons are sinful. We don't want to deal with them anymore. We want a king. And I don't think the people may have realized that God is in fact the one that was the king that was judging through the judges. And I realize some of them were disobedient, but God could work through that. And, and he would judge those judges as well, just as he judged the sons of Eli for their sins. God would not put up with that. People that are called into positions like that are held to a higher standard. And he says, they say, we want someone to fight our battles. 
And really, if there's ever a dagger to me, to, to the heart of God, that might be it. Because you just think about how many times God has fought their battles. If you've been following along on this Bible study, I mean, we've gone through example after example, including the last chapter where God fought for Israel and delivered them from the Philistines. Reading in the book of Joshua, again, example after example of God working miracles and doing marvelous, miraculous things in order to deliver Israel from the hands of its enemies. Are we seeing God deliver the Israelites from the hands of the Egyptians? I mean, it's again and again, God goes to battle. God fights for his people. And yet they say, we want a king to fight for us. As if God wasn't good enough. And they reject the God that we love and serve as king over themselves and they want an earthly king. And so Samuel heard all the words of the people and he repeated them in the hearing of the Lord. So the Lord said to Samuel, heed their voice, make them a king. And Samuel said to every man, uh, to the men of Israel, every man go to his city. And so he sends everyone away to their city and he said, we're going to make a king. Everyone go home first. It seems like a solemn end to the chapter here. Um, I will say that God had, had said in Genesis and other places he knew there would be a king. So this is obviously not a surprise to God. And yet God has been rejected by Israel as king over these people. And so as we just think about this ourselves, we have to, we have to look at our own lives. And, and I've said this throughout this, this chapter and this study today, but uh, is God your king? Is God your king? Is God the one that's ruling over your life? So are you letting God fight your battles or are you trying to do it yourself? Is God your king and the one that's over your life? Have you surrendered it all? Have you laid it all down to him? Are you trusting him with everything that you are and with every, every piece of your life? Have you just given it over to him? Or are we trying to, to look to, to people that are around us that might be the experts to take care of our problems and situations? Are we trying to look to, to ourselves to be in control and, and to find a better way out of it? Um, because really we should trust it with God. We should cast it on him to just completely take it off and give it over to him, to let go of it, not to hold on to it anymore. Um, because we know that our God is trustworthy. And in the book of Romans, it says that uh, our God is working all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So I want to encourage you and challenge you this week to, to try not to be in control in everything, but to just give it over to the Lord, to trust in him, to lay it down before him, and to let God fight on your behalf, to make God the king of your life in all things, to, to submit to him and as the authority, to surrender to him, um, and to remember that we're called to be this chosen people of God, that we are this chosen people of God that have been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, given the power of the Holy Spirit, that our light would shine and that the world would see us and want to know who Jesus is because of, 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 of how we're living our lives as people that are changed by the power of God, that we're not called to be like the rest of the world. That's not what God's ever intended, is for us to be like everyone else. But he wants us to be like Jesus. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, God's conforming us into his image and his likeness more and more every day. And we need to give in to the Holy Spirit and let go of the things of the flesh to the glory of God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word here today in the book of Samuel. And <clears throat> Lord, it, it, it always frustrates us when we read your word and we see the rejection that Israel has for you. And yet, Lord, it's, it's not as clear for us <clears throat> when we look at our own lives to see our rejection of you. Let me pray, Lord, that you forgive us for that. That you forgive us for rejecting you. That you forgive us for trying to be in control. That you forgive us for trying to make everything about ourselves, about our comfort, about being fitting in, about looking like everybody else in this earth, in this world, Jesus. Because that's never how we've been intended to be. But you've intended us to be people that shine our light, that all the world may see who you are and honor and glorify you, God, in and through all things. And Jesus, we pray for your hand on us as we look to live a life for your kingdom, for your glory, and your honor. And Lord, we just cast our burdens and cares upon you, Jesus. We relinquish control today, and we pray that you would just take over and fight on our behalf, Jesus. Whatever we're going through, whether it's a sickness or a trial, a battle, God, something at work, uh, whatever may be going on in each and every one of our lives, Lord, that we would just let go and let you be in control, God. 
because you can do way better than we can. And Lord, we just relinquish our control to you today, Jesus, and we pray that you would shine your light, God, that you would shine through us, Holy Spirit, for your glory, that the world would see you and would know you, God, that you would increase and we would decrease for your glory, we pray. We love you, Lord, and we thank you, and we pray this through Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys for listening. We'll be back next week to look at 1 Samuel chapter 9.